So welcome everyone, this is Gihan Pereira and I want to talk about disruption today. Now disruption is a word that gets bandied around a lot, it's been hyped a lot. The guy who started the term um, uh, talking about disruptive innovation uh, has complained that it's been, it's been used and misused and it's been used in a number of different ways and in fact I'm going to use it slightly differently than the way that Clay Christensen, who was the guy who uh, coined the term, uh, intended. However, I think it's going to be quite useful for you to understand uh, what sort of things are happening in our world that could make a difference to the way that we run our businesses. Uh, and if you're a leader, and I'm assuming that you're either a business owner or a leader in business, then um, I hope you'll get some ideas here that will help you with your with your strategic planning. And so we're going to talk about these six kind of uh, six kinds of disruptive forces. And the reason I'm doing this is because all of us as leaders and uh, ideally as individuals have to plan as well. And What's your plan like at the moment? You may have done planning for a long time, especially if you're very experienced, but some plans aren't aligned with the future. Um, and it can be difficult because the future is changing so fast. So let me talk about like six levels of uh, planning and how you um, how you create a strategic plan. So first of all, maybe you have no plan at all. And uh, I'm, I'm assuming that you're not in this boat because uh, especially if you're a senior leader or a business owner, that's uh, almost negligent. Um, but let's say uh, if I gave, gave that a score, I'd give that a score of minus 10. The, the next level up, which some leaders do, is they do planning, but they do planning the way that they've always done planning. So the planning is a bit um, out of date, obsolete, stale is the word I've used here, because it worked in a time, in a slower time, where there was less competition, less change happening, less disruption, and that used to work, but it doesn't work anymore. Um, however, if that's, the only, if that's the only thing you've got in your kit box, then maybe that's the only way that you plan. And the next level is where you kind of understand that the world is changing fast, but you don't know what's coming up in the future, so you um, you make your plans short term. And those short term plans are brittle, They're, something changes and the plan falls apart. Or because they're so short term, you can't make any big plans, you can only make very, very small plans. So all of those are negative. So now let's, happen, let's see what happens when you cross the line, when you move into the positive space. The first thing is to become aware of what's around and uh, today's webinar is very much about that so I hope that you'll walk out you walk out today but having some awareness about some of the things that could disrupt or affect your business so awareness is good uh, but awareness is not good enough uh, you then want to create a plan that's uh, aligned with the future so um, you we're not going to get to that stage today but that that would be the next stage so once you're aware of what's um, what's uh, what's possibly going to disrupt your business and then you can get aligned to it. And finally, uh, then you can create a really strong strategic plan. And uh, the, the numbers I put there are kind of arbitrary, but I, the, the main point I want to make is that if you're currently planning below the line because you're not aware of what's around, then um, you're probably going to be in quite a bit of trouble. So let's look at some of the things that have changed and I'm going to start talking about some global things and then get very quickly into some really specific things that will be quite practical for your business. But let me give you first uh, just a couple of things that are happening on a global scale, okay, so that you get some awareness of what's happening in the world around us. Okay, so the first thing is that uh, our, our world a power has changed. It's kind of gone from broadly, very broadly speaking, north to south, west to east. Uh, Valerie Pierce pointed out that uh, if you look at this map here, uh, she pointed out there are more people living inside that green circle than outside it, which is quite amazing when you think of it. There's more than seven billion people on the planet and, a, and three and a half billion plus live inside that circle. Um, and those are yeah, some pretty big populations, and this is what uh, this is why some people refer to our time now as the Asian century. Um, and it's not just about um, it's not just about people. But let's have a look at some of the some of uh, what's happening with people. So China, the biggest country on the planet, population-wise, 1.4 billion people, and India, uh, 1.3 million, uh, 3 billion. I'm just getting a couple of notes about the slides that are slow to update. So let me just quickly. Uh, all right, so let me just show you this map again. So we've got, this is that green circle I was talking about. So more than half the world's population lives inside that circle. Um, and that's huge, that's huge. And if you think about what that means for our world and what that's meant for our world in the, the last 200 years, it's been a, a massive shift um, in terms of the world's population. And it's not just people uh, living in countries. Uh, let me switch you over to the next picture, which shows you 
the world's population if you include online populations as well. So you've got China and India with 1.4 and 1.3 billion people respectively, but both of those have now been overtaken by Facebook. So we've got 1.6 billion people and even that's sometimes considered a conservative estimate. So um, that's part of what's changed in our world, that we have not only um, the, the physical world but the online world. And there's been a power shift as well. So for most of the last 50 years we've had the G7. So these countries here, the, the USA and Canada, those four countries in Europe, um, which the, the UK, Italy, France, Germany and Japan, um, and they have dominated the world's economy. But that has changed and that is changing. So PwC predicts that by 2030 we'll have these E7 emerging economies which will also have power, uh, equal power to the G7. So uh, you can see them uh, Mexico and Brazil, Turkey and Russia, India, China and Indonesia. And then look ahead another 20 years um, to when the power of the G7 has faded away, then we have another seven countries of the frontier markets, the F7, which are Peru, Colombia, Nigeria, Morocco, uh, Philippines, Bangladesh and Vietnam, which will also have that kind of power. So if you look at and uh, this is what our world is going to look like a generation from now. It's very different from the world that we, as some of us have grown up in. Um, so what does that mean for not just at a global level but what does it mean for us and for Australian leaders? So the six biggest leadership challenges that were identified by the study of Australian leadership uh, were these. So number one was um, this is what senior leaders said that they were concerned about. Um, so market and competitive pressures, so competition, uh, operational stuff, so still getting, making sure that things are done efficiently and effectively, um, wading through the minefield and the, the quagmires of government and uh, increased regulatory environment, um, getting, getting and keeping the best people, uh, then technology and disruption due to technology, and the, what I've just talked about, the fact that our world's changing really fast and it's a volatile and uncertain environment. The one we're going to focus on here is the biggest one that was identified which was to the fact that there's competition and it's a different kind of competition. So that's specifically what I want to talk about today, that competition now uh, where it used to be uh, what you knew and what you could see coming ahead so you could plan for it is just not the case anymore. So there's some technology that's new and uh, I've shown you here some examples of some of the new technology that's available. Uh, for example, things like, and I'm not going to go through these in details, but there are things that you may have heard of like self-driving cars, um, DNA analysis of the genome, um, big data, uh, augmented reality with things like Pokemon Go and uh, business applications of that, um, commercial space flights, drones, uh, 3D printed um, medical parts and uh, even human organs, um, nanotechnology surgery. So that's a whole bunch of the technology, some of which you may have heard of, some of which you may not have heard of, and that's what's changing in our, in our world. However, uh, it's not like a self-driving car is going to drive up and take your job. Uh, well, it might if you're a taxi driver, but in general, this technology itself is not going to um, disrupt you. However, people using that technology might be the, might be the business that comes along and disrupts or at least um, severely harms your business. So let's look at these six disruptive forces. And I want to start off by um, asking the question about Uber because lots of people talk about Uber as being the poster child for disruption and there's no question it's been disruptive because it's uh, taken, on, taken on a really well established and entrenched industry, the taxi industry, and it's provided a really compelling experience. And, and remember that Uber um, was and sometimes is still illegal in many places, um, but it's provided such a great experience and such a compelling experience that is forcing society to change the laws. So here's one industry that has certainly been disrupted by somebody, by this upstart company that's coming from outside. But Uber is not the most disruptive kind of force that a business might face. In fact, I reckon there are six of them and I'm just going to briefly take you through them so you understand them. And remember that today's webinar is very much about awareness. So it, you might think of it as uh, you're looking over, you look at the top of the hill and uh, he, the disruptions coming over the hill and there are three things that, that you can see uh, coming over the hill and then there are another three which are over the other side of the hill that you can't see. So the three on this side are your competitors, your dominators and your startups. The three on the other side are upstarts, randoms and terminators. So now those 
aren't going to make much sense to you at the moment, um, but let me go through them one at a time. And as we go through this, what I'd like you to think about is to, and then write down uh, for yourself, is what are the businesses in each of these six categories that could disrupt yours. And then we're going to stop after the first three, and I'll give you the chance to share. Uh, so share in the in the question box what you've uh, what you've written down, um, and then we'll do the other three. Okay, so let's start off with competitors. This, this is the easy one. This is the easy one to understand. So these are people who are already in your industry. They're the people that you're um, already competing with for market share and mind share of customer. So who are the people who are possibly um, your competition? So for me, for example, as a futurist, as a conference keynote speaker, then I know my competition are other speakers. Uh, they are not, all, not, not necessarily uh, futurists, but anybody who would want um, who would want to get booked for, say, an opening keynote presentation at a conference or the morning presentation after the big night the night before um, or the closing keynote presentation at a conference. So in my role as a keynote speaker, those are my direct competitors. Now there are some other kinds of competition as well, but for the moment, let's, let's look at these. These are your competitors. These are the people who you're directly competing with for the same kind of work and uh, you're offering the same sort of value. Okay, and as a leader and as a planner, you probably know who they are and you probably know what you're doing that's making you different from them. So that's the first, that first one, that's the easy one. And the second one is a dominator. So um, what happens if you're a corner store and Coles and Woolies, Coles or Woolies, moves into town? So these are the giants. So these, these are competition, but this is competition at a much bigger scale. These are people who when they come in, they not only disrupt your business, but they basically disrupt all your competitors as well. So the, these are big guys in town. So who would that be in your business, in your industry? Um, and the answer is going to be different for, for every industry and every business. Um, however, like you, you'd, you'd know who they are. Um, so you know, who are they? I'm, I'm asking you to, to make a note of them for yourself. Um, and again, even though that might be a, um, a big shake-up when it happens, you can probably predict uh, who, the, who those people could be. Um, as I said, if you're a corner store, it could be the Coles and Woolies coming in. And you have, to, you have to prepare for that. So it may not be easy, it may be challenging, but at least you can see it coming. The third kind are the startups. So this is like the, it's almost the other end of the scale from the dominators. The dominators are the uh, the big guys in town, the people with deep pockets. Um, the startups are uh, that they're just starting up. They they're coming in with um, no database, no client records, no resources. Maybe a little bit of startup money. It may be something that the founders have put in their own money. And op the stereotype is they're operating out of a garage, and they're coming in and they're competing. Um, so one of my best examples, one of my favorite examples of a startup is this company called AliveCore. And what they do is they do, you can do an ECG on your smartphone. So um, if you have a heart condition, like my dad had a heart attack 10 years ago, and he's fine, uh, but it does mean that he has to go back for regular checkups and he goes to the cardiologist and has to do an expensive series of tests, an expensive and extensive series of tests. But now they've got this little device that you attach to the back of your iPhone and you can do an ECG yourself. And that data is then sent wirelessly to a remote monitoring center who can then notify your cardiologist. It costs about a dollar a test, and now you can administer it yourself. So this is a this is a company that's come in and disrupted that business. And uh, of course, cardiologists still have a role, but one part of their business uh, is no longer required. It's become obsolete because this this startup that's come in um, and it's completely approved by the TGA and the FDA in the USA. So it's come in completely legally, but it's provided an alternative to something that uh, was was a pretty, um, pretty profitable part of a business and required a lot of specialist knowledge. So who are the startups uh, in your industry, in your business? Okay, so we've done the first three, which were the, the competitors, the dominators, and the startups. Um, I'd like you to just, if you've been making notes already and would like to share, um, in the question box, uh, I'm going to keep this anonymous if you share it, because uh, it doesn't matter who's sharing. Um, but if you've got a question, I'll read it out and I'll tell you who's asking the question. But if you want to say, um, dominator is Coles. Okay, uh, or a startup is so and so. Then just type that in the question box, and that'll um, and I'll read I'll read that out just so other people have got examples of it. And if you don't have that, that's okay. We'll just continue. 
Okay, so those are the first three, the competitors, the dominators, and the startups. So you notice things like Uber haven't appeared yet. And there's a, uh, we're going to talk about Uber next, and uh, things like Uber and Airbnb, because they are startups, but they're a special kind of startup. So we'll come to that next. Okay, I'm going to keep. I'm going to keep going. Um, so, so we haven't yet talked about these upstarts, randoms, and terminators, uh, but they are the ones we're going to talk about next. And the reason we're going to talk about that, the reason why I've put them on the other side of the hill, is because the three on this side, um, going up the hill, you can probably predict them. Uh, you may not know exactly where a startup is going to come from, but you know the sort of things that uh, in your business, that uh, if the world is fast, flat and free, you know the sort of things that are slow, bumpy and expensive, and any one of those things could be a risk or a threat, and it could be something that a startup could then jump in. Um, but the three on the other side are a little bit harder to see, and I'll explain why. Uh, okay, so somebody here has said that, uh, and like I said, I'll keep this anonymous, the big four accounting firms who say they specialize in consulting. So this is somebody who's a consultant, and uh, they can see that that's a dominator. Uh, when that dominator comes into the industry, or they increase their advertising, or they uh, go after market share, then they will stop the small consultants. They'll get in the way of small consultants. Another comment coming in, a healthcare security consultant. Yeah, I, th I think that's talking about a dominator, I think, that person's talking about there. Okay, so let's look at the three on the other side, um, because they're the ones that you may not be able to see as quickly, but you, you can still plan for them a little bit. Uh, and so where we talked about startups before, I'm now talking about upstarts. And Uber's an upstart, and the, the dis distinction between the startups and the upstarts is that the upstarts can kind of they, they do play outside the rules. So Uber came into an industry that was regulated and just bypassed all the regulation. And as I said, it was illegal in some places. Um, Airbnb has come into and uh, coming in and disrupting the accommodation industry, which is another industry that's been heavily regulated. Um, in healthcare, there's a huge rise in medical tourism. So people traveling particularly from Australia to Asia, where they get really world-class medical facilities and they can get uh, medical work done for a fraction of the price uh, as good quality, but and, and taking into account flights and accommodation and expenses is still cheaper than getting it done in Australia. Uh, so these are people who are doing things completely legally, but they're outside the Australian uh, legal framework or the regulatory framework. So these are the upstarts. They come in and they... Um, they operate on what's not a, not a level playing field. Okay, so that's the first one. And um, the next one is the randoms. And uh, you may wonder why there's a picture here of Qantas and AIA, which is an insurance company, but this is exactly the point. So what AIA does, uh, so I've just I recently switched my insurances because my insurance broker got me some um, better deals um, on, with some other insurance companies. And one of them was AIA, and uh, it was for... A trauma, or oh, I can't remember, TPD, and the insurance stuff puts me to sleep, but uh, some insurance, and part of what I get is I get, uh, I get membership of AIA's Vitality program, and that gives me a 10% discount every time I book with Qantas. Now, 10% is quite significant for me because I travel a lot and uh, I live in Perth, so airfares are higher. And I'm sure AIA, they've got actuaries who've done all the maths and they figure out that they can afford to support somebody like me because overall they get more members this way. Now, that's not very competitive. Sorry, that's not very disruptive if you think about AIA and other in the insurance industry because every insurance company offers those kind of benefits where there's movie tickets or um, other sort of little perks. But think about what it does for the travel industry. They're travel agents who are operating on much smaller margins and 10% and suddenly AIA, a random company from completely outside the industry who doesn't even care about becoming a travel agent, it could be potentially disrupting um, at least that segment of the travel industry. So that's what I mean by random uh, and it's hard to predict them because they, um, they are coming in from outside the industry and they may not even care. So they're actually not going head to head with you. And the last one, which is potentially even bigger, are the terminators. And by that, these are the businesses or, um, yeah, these are businesses that come in using something, quite often using new technology, and they completely wipe out uh, other industries. Not the, unlike the dominators, which kind of wipe out all the competition in their industry, the terminators wipe out other industries. So, for example, um, here, here are Google's driverless cars, and self-driving cars are going to make a big difference, but they don't only affect uh, car manufacturing and car ownership. They affect a whole bunch of other 
um, they have a whole bunch of other uh, knock-on effects that could affect a number of other industries. For example, here's a really obvious one, um, car insurance. So you no longer need to get car insurance because you're not driving the car. No one in the car is driving the car, so you're not responsible for safe driving. Another one which is again um, a little bit more of a stretch but you can imagine that you don't need car parks anymore so the large car park operators um, don't won't be that they'll be obsolete because uh, self-driving cars don't need car parks because a car comes along uh, takes you somewhere and drops you off and then goes back and goes on the next trip so it's like a like, like a taxi service but a perpetual taxi service without a driver so there's no need for car parks anymore and there's some reports that predict or some studies that suggest that one third of traffic in major CBDs is uh, people driving around looking for parking spots so you don't need that you don't need uh, parking lanes on the side of a road you don't need car parks multi-story car parks so that industry uh, disappears um, a little bit less obviously, think about accommodation. So um, people who travel, say, for business, um, they won't have to necessarily um, get there the night before because they have to go to a business meeting in the morning, uh, so they don't need to stay in a hotel overnight because they, the, the night before they get in their car at home uh, and the car drives itself while you can be asleep in your car. So you don't need that overnight accommodation anymore. And remember, all the cars aren't going to look like this little, uh, this tiny little bug that you see behind you uh, on the back of this slide. And they, self-driving cars can look like anything. They can look like they can look like hotel rooms and be, be hotel rooms. And, and one other example, a kind of macabre, morbid example, is that self-driving cars are much safer and are going to be even safer when the only cars are self-driving uh, cars. Um, and so there'll be far fewer accidents and uh, far fewer deaths on the road. So there are the, if you like, the side effect of that is companies who, and um, businesses that like funeral directors who actually get business when people die, there will be fewer deaths and therefore their business will be harmed as well. So these are these are examples of um, companies who take on board self-driving cars can have these knock-on effects and, and these ripples go much further than their company that, that company alone. Okay, so those are six disruptive uh, forces. And um, what again? I hope you've been writing down. Um, are examples from your industry or things that could potentially disrupt your industry and what have you got so um, I see a few people have been writing things down so somebody has written this in the startup area um, for yeah new law firms that use advanced technology AI and streamlining law advice yeah exactly right in fact next week I'm speaking in Brisbane doing the closing conference conference keynote for the Queensland Law Society and they are looking very much about the, at the future and they're looking at the uh, the law firm of the future or legal advice in the future um, and it's good that they're looking at that because that's exactly what could be happening in the future and it's already happening now in many of the professions including law um, somebody else here has said a Terminator is uh, self-pay kiosks. Okay, so this person has identified in her industry, and um, that could be something that has a knock-on effect. It doesn't affect a, a not direct competitor, but could have that knock-on effect. Okay, so I, um, we, you know, we haven't stopped for, for a lot of time for questions, um, but I hope that you've had the chance to make notes for yourself looking at these six dis disruptive forces. And if you go back to that slide that I showed you uh, right at the start when I was talking about which level are you at with your planning, um, as I said, the purpose of this webinar was to give you some awareness. And the next step is to then create a plan that's aligned to that. So, uh, and all it means is looking through each one of these six areas and doing some what if scenarios. So what if, and, and the, the first half is easy, like what are your competitors, who are the dominators, who are the startups, but then looking at what if somebody comes in and they operate outside the rules? And what if somebody comes in and they, um, from completely outside the industry, but they can, they do something that and knocks one of our big profit centers and um, what if uh, a whole industry becomes obsolete and customers don't need us anymore okay so that's what I'd like you to do as, as the next step so to get to alignment is to to ask those what if questions for each one of those six kinds of disruptive forces um, there's a story that you may have heard of about two hunters who are out in the forest and they leave their weapons behind they're standing by and getting washed and they they've just dressed uh, and they're suddenly confronted by an angry bear who starts chasing them 
and they start running because that's all they can do. They've got no weapons, they've got no equipment, uh, and they're just running. And then while they're running, the the bear's still a while away, but rapidly great, uh, gaining ground. And one of the hunters stops, pulls off what he's got in his backpack, and pulls off his backpack and starts changing his hiking boots for his running shoes. And his friend says to him, "What are you doing? There's no way you can outrun a bear." And he says, "I don't need to outrun a bear. I just need to outrun you." And I hope you look at this uh, the same way, that you don't have to know every possible technology, every possible scenario. And uh, the good news is that very few people are doing this kind of future alignment when they're doing the strategic planning. So you don't have to outrun everything that's happening. You only have to outrun your competition. And it may not be as hard as you think. So um, again, as I said, if you want the details and uh, a little bit more detail, then please get the, the Future Proof um, report that I'm going to send you at the end of the, the webinar and when you complete the exit survey. Um, so um, you may not know this if you'll just listen to the recording, but live we've had a couple of a couple of little technical glitches, but uh, with the slides not showing with the new version of the webinar software. But thank you for everyone for coming along. Um, I hope you got value from this. Uh, if you are a a regular subscriber to the webinar series, uh, and if you're watching this live, that means you automatically are, then you'll automatically automatically get notified about the new webinars as they come up. If you're not watching it live, then you can register for the webinar series free from my website. So you just have to go to gihanperera.com and you can register for the webinar series. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you in a month's time, and I hope this has helped you uh, get aligned with your, with your business strategy so that it's aligned with future trends. Thanks everyone. And bye for now.